اهلا بكم جميعا الصحبه الجميله واصدقائنا وزملائنا الاعزاء النهارده يوم علمي ان شاء الله يطلع كويس على الفوت اند انكل موديول وان شاء الله نتمنى ان كل الناس تستفيد من التوبكس اللي هنقولها النهارده معانا طبعا دكتورنا الغالي دكتور طارق الكمل ودكتورنا العزيز صديقي الغالي دكتور اسلام سرحان وانا طبعا دكتور سعيد شقيدق هنكلمكم النهارده عن انا معاك انا معاك يا سعيد دكتور عادل رفعت زي حضرتك انت مش شايفني هو طارق طارق دخل ولا لسه انا شايف اسلام هو موجود انا موجود يا دكتور عادل حبيبه طارق حبيبه طارق منور يا حبيبي والله منور الله يخليك منور يا اسلام ربنا يوفقك يا رب منور يا شباب وبالتوفيق يا رب ان شاء الله يبقى يوم جميل وتبقوا انسبايرنج كده للناس اليانج جنريشنز ان هم ياخدوا فوت اند اكل ياما باذن الله ان شاء الله يا ريت يا ريت ان شاء الله ان شاء الله اتفضل يا دكتور سعيد اتفضل ماشي فالنهارده ان شاء الله نكلمكم عن الـ الـ شويه توبكس في في الفوت اند انكل احنا طبعا مده التوك لكل واحد هتبقى ثلث ساعه عشان بس احافظ على وقت الزملاء اللي بيتفرجوا وهنبدا طبعا بدكتورنا الغالي دكتور طارق الجمل هيكلمنا عن الاين فود ديفورميتيز اسسمنت اند مانجمنت اتفضل دكتور طارق اهلا وسهلا احب في البدايه اشكر دكتور عادل رفعت على الدعوه الكريمه واخواتي وزملائي الدكتور سعيد ودكتور عبد الله حماد انا طارق جمل كونسلتنت فوتر انكل سيرجن يونيفرستي هوسبيتال في برمنجهام وكنت نائب في جامعه اسكندريه في مستشفى الحضر الجامعي من 2003 ل 2006 هنتكلم النهارده عن اسسمنت اند سيرجيكال مانجمنت اوف ادلت هاين فوت ديفورميتيز First of all, we need to all accept this concept, which is the tripod concept. That's the cornerstone of management of any food deformity. And this is always your aim to get the food plenty grade when you manage whether it's conservatively or surgically any food deformity. So your aim is to get the weight distributed across the first metatarsal head, the fifth metatarsal head, and the center of the calcaneum. So the foot is plenty grade. We're going to discuss, in brief, Pesgaver's deformity. You'll be very lucky if you see idiopathic or simple Pesgaver's. Once you have a Pesgaver's, you always need to look for a neuromuscular cause. So it's always advisable to get a nerve conduction study. Other forms of Pesgaver's are Pesgaver virus. So Pes is the foot, Cavo is the midfoot and virus ref refers to the heel or the calcaneum. The commonest causes are CMT, which is sharp with married tooth, cerebral palsy, stroke, residual club foot, and virus malunion of the talus. The other type is pes calcaneo cavus, and the commonest cause, which was widespread pandemic before in Egypt, is the poliomyelitis. How to assess Pascavus? Usually the patient comes complaining of callosities under the metatarsal head, as you can see, high arch, glowing of the toes, and four foot vulgus. Part of the assessment as well is that you must appreciate the muscle imbalance. Is in the shark with Marie tooth, there is weak peroneus previs and strong tibialis posterior tendon, and that leads the heel to drift into varus. In the same time, the tibialis anterior is weak and the peroneus longus is overfiring. And as we all know, the peroneus longus is serts in the plantar aspect of the first metatarsal head. It's a plantar flexor of the first ray, and that leads to four foot vulgus, as you can see in the picture. So, well, I've been mentioning Charcot Marie Tooth a few times now. Is it actually common in Egypt? To answer your question is yes. This is based on epidemiological study globally that shows that 12 out of 100,000 in Egypt, which is ranked sixth across the world, has got CMT. 
to compare that and to appreciate how high this percentage is. When polio fight started in Egypt in the late 18, 1980s by the UNICEF and the WHO, the prevalence was between 14 and 18 cases per 100,000. So the message here that the CMT in Egypt does exist, but it's underdiagnosed. And the only way you can get to the bottom of this and know and appreciate this diagnosis is by getting nerve conduction study. So as I mentioned from the assessment, it would be dorsi weak dorsiflexion, weak eversion because the peroneus pubis is weak, hind foot virus, and it's important to appreciate whether it is fixed or flexible to the Coleman block test. So you get the patient. First, if you look at the picture on the bottom right, you can see the heel is in varus. Once you get the patient to stand on a block, keeping the first tray out, if the deformity is forefoot driven, which means that first ray is excessively plantar flex and it's the main driving force of the deformity and there is no arthritis in the hind foot, you will see that the hind foot is corrected. That means there's a flexible hind foot. Why is that important? We'll get through that because it tells you and it dictates you what you need to do when you start treating, managing, treating or managing this patient surgically. Moving on about XA, what are you going to find? You, you're going to look at the X-ray and you find there's a high calcaneal pitch angle, which is the angle between the horizontal line and the lower part of the calcaneum, normally between 25 to 30 degrees. It's much higher in pes cavus. And you can see almost everything end on. You can see the lateral marius, sublux posterior, and that's because of the rotation. You can see the meris angle, which is the angle which should be around zero. The line bisecting the talus should bisect the the first metatarsal, and you can see now it's excessive cavus deformity in here, which indicates plantar flex phase here. You can see in the lower right x-ray here, you can see everything in down. You can see the cuboid, you can see the navicular, and you can see the cuneiform. That means that everything is rotated, and that's the cornerstone when you try to manage those deformities. Other presentations. So sometimes patients present you with a fracture of the base fifth metatarsal. You go and treat that in a plaster or fix that, and it goes into non union. And that's because we haven't appreciated the initial reason for that, the main reason for that, which was the pescatus. Others is virus and laxity. Patients keep coming, up, usually, I've seen that one during my visits to Egypt that, oh, I'm handball player or a volleyball player, he comes ankle instability. Why is that? It just take the shoe off and let the patient stand and walk and you'll immediately see that he's got a virus here. And that's the main reason because this is the tension side of the deformity. Hence, it's always under tension. And once you go into un on any uneven surface, that will lead to the ankle sprain straight away. So by doing a brostrum repair for this, you will, it will definitely fail. Surgical management, we need to appreciate that there are lots of stresses, 100,000 pounds of stress on a normal foot when you walk for one mile. And that's why I was stressing initially about the tripod concept. So if that load is concentrated or focused in one point, whether the calcaneum, the first metatarsal, that can lead to stress fractures, the aches and the pain the patient present with. And unfortunately, there are no established guidelines or algorithms for managing, surgically managing the patients with pescavus. And each patient treatment should be tailored according to the patient findings. And that's the message I want to give here. Also, so I'm going to take you through one of my patient's journeys, how I usually manage a patient with pescavus. So pitfalls for surgical management. If the foot is flexible and there's no bony deformity, you can get away, in most of the cases, with soft tissue procedures like plantar fascia release, tendon Achilles lengthening, or tendon transfers. If the foot is still flexible, but you cannot get it plantigrade because it's sitting into virus, you can do the soft tissue procedure, but you need to add a bony procedure to it, like when you're managing the clotos, first metatarsal, dorsiflexion osteotomy, lateral 
sliding calcaneal osteotomy. If the foot is rigid, the gold standard is triple arthrodesis. However, you always aim to maintain flexibility of the foot rather than rushing into fusion. Fusion is always the easy answer for us as surgeons, but it's a one-way street. There's no way back once you offer the patient fusion. There's no, nothing can be done afterwards if the patient come back, comes back to you. So surgical management of pest cavus based on hind foot flexibility. If, the fl if there's flexible hind foot, and I mean if you put them on, on the Coleman block, you do the Coleman block test and you find that the hind foot virus is corrected, that means the deformity is forefoot driven. Usually, usually, and as I mentioned to you, there is no golden rules for managing pest cavus, but usually you get away with correcting the forefoot only. If the hind foot is fixed and the patient does have osteoarthritis, but it's asymptomatic, and that comes from your assessment and history, you can get away with lateral displacement calcaneal osteotomy. If it's symptomatic OA, unfortunately, it will be triple arthrodesis. Triple arthrodesis is very useful when you've got weak muscles like and, paral and paralysis like in polyomyelitis. So going through the procedures very quickly and uh, pitfalls and what you need to do. For soft tissue procedure, for me, partial plantar fasciotomy is almost always the start for me. When I book this patient on my list, I always tell my theater staff it can be an hour or it can be four hours because it's step by step. It's like a domino effect and you keep building up. You start with the partial plantar fasciotomy and then you assess and then you go to step one. It's like that. You take it step by step. So it's done through a, a small medial approach and under vision, you can partially cut the plantar fascia. Also, this procedure can be done endoscopically. Equinus, which almost always there, tend to Achilles lengthening. As we all, we all know, there are more than 25 procedures described for tend to Achilles lengthening. My preference in the Pascavis scenario is the gastric recession. And you can do that through a medial incision around the bulk of the muscle, and you can do chevron, three chevron cuts in the gastric, and that will lead to the give in the Achilles and prevent the equinus. And then you reassess. Patient have got weak aversion through lateral incision. You can do perineus longus to perineus previous transfer or tenodesis if you want to call it like that. If you see here, that's the line of the incision. Peroneus previous, as you know, is the one closer to the bone. The peroneus longer is that one. You cut the peroneus longus, which is over firing, and you tenodise that to the peroneus previous to correct the weak eversion. Clawing of the toes. If the patient coming to you complaining of clawing of the toes, usually because, again, the load is not well distributed. If the toes are flexible, you can do a virus theotomy. You do that through a dorsal incision, a horizontal, near horizontal cut, periarticular. You slide the metatarsal head, which offloads it from the sole of the foot. You fix that with a screw, choose a two millimeter screw between 12 and 14 millimeters, and you can shave the bone after that. In my practice, I do that via mini invasive technique without any metal work. Clawing again. If for salvage, if the deformity is fixed, the toe is sublaxed or dislocated, you can do Stensby procedure. Stensby procedure is done through a dorsal incision. You cut the extensor tendon, tendon about one centimeter proximal to the MTP joint, and then you excise most of the proximal phalanx up to the level of the condyles. You do your reduction and you do extensor to flexor, tenodesis, and you keep a wire in. You'll end up with a toe like that. It will be flail, but it will be less painful. Again, dorsiflexion, first metastasis theotomy, moving on to the big toe. You can see here, the forefoot is in vulgus. The big toe is at a lower level than the other toes. So what I need to do is make a cut at the back of the first metatarsal, 
about one to two centimeters distal to the TMT joint. You got a wedge of bone, which is about 10 degrees angle with your toe, and then you put your tension band. And again, in my practice, I do that by many invasive technique without tension band with a one, by a one centimeter incision and putting a screw across to hold the reduction. In 20% of the cases, you might find that you still haven't got the correction right. If you look here, when I'm putting my hand underneath, what I'm feeling for is the ball of the foot. Normally you feel flesh and fat underneath. If they're all at the same level, I'm happy with that and I'll move on and that's, that's it done with the four foot correction. If I can feel more of the second and third toe here, it means they are actually plantar flex and I can proceed with a similar technique, but for the second and or the third metatarsal dorsiflexion osteotomy. Moving on to the hind foot, where again, there are multiple procedures described and multiple osteotomies described of how you need to do your uh, uh, osteotomy to correct the deformity. We're just talking about principles here. In my practice, I do lateral displacement calcaneal osteotomy. It's done through a lateral incision, respecting the longer hand uh, lines. You do the displacement osteotomy, you move it lateral like so. On the left hand side and he fixed it with two screws. Again, in the last seven, eight years, I've never opened, uh, uh, done an open technique for calcaneus totomy. I usually do it through uh, many invasive surgery and your aim is to lateralize the weight bearing axis of the heel and hence the line of pull of the Achilles tendon. It's all back to the basics when you're trying to restore the tripod. I'm not sure if any of our colleagues have seen this picture before. I think Mr. Sarhan might know it. It was published in the British Medical Journal in 2011. It was a multi-center prospective comparative study between the strength and the intelligence of the orthopedic surgeons compared to their anesthetic colleagues. And guess what? We are much cleverer than them and we've got way better grip strength. So you guys need to be proud. Okay, moving on to adult uh, pest planus. The commonest cause for adult pest planus is the tibialis posterior dysfunction. Other causes are inflammatory arthropathies like rheumatoid, osteoarthritis, shock arthropathy can lead to that post peripheral neuropathy, accessory navicular bone, which is a congenital uh, pest uh, planus, connective tissue disorders like systemic lupus, and post-traumatic. What does the tibialis posterior actually do? If you look here, this is the line, the axis of the tibialis joint, and this is the axis of the calcaneal cruboid joint. The tibialis posterior tendon is the primary dynamic stabilizer of the medial longitudinal arch. It inverts and plantar flexes the foot, locks the mid-tarsal joint, like in this photo here, inverse the subtalar joint, and that will lead to stability of hind foot. So why do you need that? Imagine if you're standing on your tiptoes, starting to do the propulsion, starting to take your toe off, and you have a very flimsy, flac flaccid foot, you won't be able to take off. So it is very important to guarantee there's a rigid mid and hind foot for effective Achilles function during, for, during foot propulsion. That's the function of the tibialis posterior. So how to diagnose tibialis posterior dysfunction? The typical patient is a middle-aged female. They got medial ankle discomfort along the territory of the tibialis posterior tendon. They've got lateral ankle pain or sinus tarsi pain or what I call it lateral impingement type pain over here. And if you look there, this is the tension side of the deformity and everything on this side is squeezed. That's why they get this sinus tarsi type pain. And that's why the tibialis posterior tendon fails in, in tension on this side of the deformity. And they can have secondary hallux valgus secondary metatarsalgia, secondary hallux surgeries. And guess why is, does this happen? It's because the tripod has been interrupted. It's all back to basics. 
So when you look at the patient, they've got a depressed arch, they've got abducted midfoot, or what we call two many toes sign. If you're standing into attention, you can normally see the fourth and fifth ray when you're looking from behind. But if you look here, you can see up to the big toe actually all the five rays. That means that the midfoot is abducted. And I'll explain to you why this happens in the late stages of the uh, tibialis posterior dysfunction. Hind foot vulgus, as we can see here, normally the hind foot is at about five degrees of vulgus. This is a bit exaggerated, but this is way too exaggerated on the left hand side. The double heel raise can the patient, when the patient stands on their tiptoe, they start in vulgus. Does this correct or not? Again, seem like the principle of Pescavis. You need to appreciate whether the hind foot is flexible or not. Moving on to the classification, Johnson has told I'm not a big fan of classifications. Classifications are something that need to tell you, need to be reliable, need to tell you how to treat the patient and what the prognosis should be. And those are the one of the few occasions where I try to use classifications or I learn classifications because they help me with the management. So for stage one, there will be swelling pain across the tibialis posterior tendon, no flat foot and the patient is able to single hair raise. When you ask the patient to stand against the wall, lift the normal side up and stand on tiptoes of the bad side. If they can do it, it means that they are in pain. It means that the tibialis posterior is still functioning. Stage 2A, there is loss of arch and they are unable to single hair raise. But still the foot, the midfoot looks straight. Stage 2B, the abducted midfoot, or what we call two many toes sign. Stage 3, when they stand on tiptoes, the hind foot doesn't move. There is subtalar arthritis, or sometimes there is talonavicular arthritis associated. Stage, stage 4, which is myosin modification, there is lateral ankle degenerative changes. And I would advise you, do not let your patient reach that stage, and you will see why later on. Looking at the x-ray, they must be standing views. That We mentioned earlier in the past cave, there is the means line, which is the line bisecting the first metatarsal, should cross the midsection of the talus, should bisect the talus. If you look here, your talus is facing downwards. It's plantar flex. And if you look in the AP view here, this is the navicular, this is the talus. The talus is coming out, which we call the talonavicular uncoverage. So why does this happen? Why does the two, the, the PES planus start from pain in the tibialis posterior and moves on to abduction of the midfoot and to positive two manito signs? Back to basics, back to anatomy. If you look at this tendon here, the plantar calcaneal navicular ligament, that's the spring ligament. It acts like a hammock. It's lifting the talus from underneath and preventing it from subluxing medially. So it's the actual support of the tailor head. That's why it's very important to get an MRI so you can appreciate uh, how does, what's the condition of the spring ligament. Surgical management. I told you that this is one of the few occasions where I use the classifications. For stage one, put your patient in a boot or a plaster for six weeks and then reassess. Stage 2A, you do a medial displacement calcaneal osteotomy plus flexor digital and longus uh, transfer. Stage 2B, same like above, but you need to add spring ligament reconstruction to correct the midfoot abduction. Stage 3, in the textbooks, it's mentioned triple fusion. I prefer isolated fusions, whether subtalar, talonavicular, or double fusion, and I'll explain to you why. Stage four, it's pantalar fusion. It's a nightmare. It takes four or five hours, and patient end with a very stiff lower limb, and the rate of amp the amputation rate can be up to 20%. That's why I was telling you, don't let your patient reach that stage. You can always add gastro section, like we mentioned with the pest cave, is to correct the tight Achilles cord. So the media displacement calcaneal osteotomy you do with bilateral incision. 
you do your osteotomy and you displace it, and then you flip the patient over open medially. This is the inflamed tissue that you is anterior. You must debride it because it's the cause for pain. You expose the navicular bone. You find the master knot of Henry and you cut the FDL, the flexor digitorum longus, and you reroute it through the navicular. Some people just stitch it in. I prefer to use a tenodice screw here for the FDL to replace the function of the tibialis posterior tendon. Again, I'd rather do that via many invasive techniques, including the FDL transfer. Spring ligament reconstruction, and I know this system, the internal brace system, is available in Egypt through a uh, couple of companies, actually. So you drill through the sustain tackle and tilli, that's the origin of the spring ligament, aiming plantry to avoid the subtalar joint. And then you put the swivel lock in there, drill the navicular bone. If you're gonna do FDL transfer, which is commonly the, the case, you whiplash the FDL tendon, and then you feed the spring ligament, one from plantar to dorsal and one from dorsal to plantar, again, to reproduce the same hammock effect again of the spring ligament through that hole. You can just tie it up. If you're worried about the wall is weak, I prefer use swivel lock or a tenodice screw. And that's to correct the abduction of the midfoot. You finish that procedure, the foot still look like this. Looks supinated, it's not plantigrade. So what would you do? You do the cotton osteotomy, which is a plantar flexion, first metatarsal, osteo uh, first metatarsal osteotomy, or through the medial cuneiform. You make a dorsal cut, dorsal incision over the first metatarsal here. With the saw, you cut the cuneiform and preserve the plantar wedge. Some people just open it up and leave it like that and uh, put a plate on. I prefer putting a wedge of bone graft inside with no metal work. And they, they will heal because you already, when you do the osteotomies for the heel, you will be keeping this patient six weeks in plaster anyway, and non bearing so that's, that should be fine. I mentioned to you stage three in the literature, it mentioned the gold standard strip effusion. I'd rather not do that. And I'll explain to you why. If you do the isolated subtalar fusion, if that's the main cause of the pain, the patient has got pain on uneven surfaces, if you use the lateral approach, you must keep the sinus fat. This has got a very high rate of wound adhesions. Imagine this was, this will become the tension side of the deformity once you correct it, because we don't do inside occlusion. When we do the lateral approach, we open up the subtalar joint, and that will lead to more tension on the skin. So I would rather not do it through lateral approach and I'll show you how I do it. Isolated telonavicular fusion. Some pitfalls when you do any telonavicular fusion, always spin first after correction of the deformity. You correct the deformity by dorsiflexing the toes and pin it for preliminary fixation. And you always do two point fixation to, to have equal compression across the tail on a vicar. It's got almost 20% chance of non-union. You can use one plate staple, two screws, two plates, whatever, as long as you use two things, one on the medial side and one on the lateral side. This is how you get your best chance of getting this joint to unite. Double fusion. I mentioned to you I'd rather not do it through lateral approach. In my practice, I do it through medial approach. It's not as scary as you think. Here's the outline of it. That's the medium malleus. That's an avicular tuberosity, about one to two centimeter dorsal to it. And that's the line of my incision. You open there, there's a capsule straight on. You're on the posterior facet of the subtalar joint. If you've got this fancy tool uh, as a distractor, you open up and you can see the joint end on. The more you prepare the joint, the more you take the cartridge off, the more you'll be able to see. And then you extend it a bit distally, and you'll be able to see the telonavicular joint. And as I told you, not an inside effusion. You have to correct the deformity. You can see here 
Now, the meters line is restored. The line bisecting the talus is almost going through the line bisecting the first metatarsal. I mentioned to you, triple fusion is a traditional treatment. Even the X-ray I'm quoting doesn't have triple fusion in. Why don't I have fused the calcaneal cuboid joint? Once you correct the deformity, you will lead, you will cause widening or gaping of the calcaneal cuboid joint. So why fuse a joint when you've already done some sort of distraction arthroplasty for the joint? That's my theory. And not only me, by the way, it's, it's most of the surgeons in the UK and in Europe have got the same principle. And it's also got a very high non-union rate. You're putting a lot of shear forces across this calcaneal cuboid joint. And you need to ask yourself, why am I fusing this? Why am I adding more metal work? Why am I asking the, the biology to fuse another joint? This is how the stage four X-ray look like. I don't think any of us will fancy doing that. Are there any simpler options for the teenagers and the elderly, especially for the elderly? And I've come across that uh, a lot in Egypt. Lots of patients, because of their comorbidities, their already weak core strength. If you offer them a calcaneosteotomy and put them in plaster for six weeks, they will definitely lose their core strength. So if they're walking independently, they'll end up with a stick. They end up, if you use a stick, they end up using a Zimmer frame. So is there a simpler option? Yes, there is. It is subtalar arthroresis, where you allow the joint to go into maximum varus, but limit the valgus. How can you do that? It's a very simple day case procedure. A one centimeter incision over the sinus tarsi, which lies almost a finger width at the tip of the uh, lateral malleus. One, you, you feed the guide wire in, and you can see the angulation of the guide wire, which follows the trajectory of the subtalar joint and then you sequentially dilate the joint till you reach this, the you appreciate the correct side of the of the screw inside and your landmark is don't go on the ap view beyond the midline of the terrace or else you'll be in the area of danger where the neurovascular bundle is and in the lateral view you need to correct the medius angle. The line bisecting the talus should be bisecting the first metatarsal, and that's back again to the basic restore the tripod anatomy. You can associate that with FDL transfer or spring ligament reconstruction if the patient has got abducted midfoot. Thank you very much. شكرا دكتورنا الغالي دكتور طارق على المحاضرة الجميلة دي في أي حد يا جماعة عنده أي سؤال بالنسبة لمحاضرة دكتور طارق؟ Very nice talk يا طارق. Thank you. شكرا يا طارق. شكرا يا طارق والله ده الموضوع عايز دي very deep thinking يا طارق يا ربي. طبعا. مش سهل أبدا. يعني المفروض الواحد يقراه كذا مرة بصراحة. أنا حاولت أفولو ال على قد ما اقدر بس مش قادر يا طارق مش قادر الموضوع صعب فعلا يا باشا ده انت الرئيس يا باشا لا الموضوع صعب والله يعني ربنا يخليك لا والله الموضوع صعب هو محتاج يعني الفوت سيرجري زي الهاند سيرجري يعني محتاجه شويه ايه يعني 3 دي ثينكينج مش جاست سمبل كويشن وسمبل انسر يعني محتاجه ديب ثينكينج فعلا I've got a lot, lots of toys to play with. That's why I picked the foot yeah. and ankle, Dr. Adam. Oh, it's a meadak, Allah. It's a meadak, Rabbi. Rabbi, wafak, Rabbi. Well, Dr. Tariq, uh, one of the Zumala is Al Hassan. He says, in which stage does Mr. Tariq use arthroresis? Arthroresis. As I mentioned, uh, arthroresis, I always use it in the uh, teenagers. Usually, it works very well between the age of 12 to, to, to 16. Uh, elderly. Stage one and up to stage two B. And even sometimes I've been more brave now if the patient has got arthritis, but it's not that symptomatic. And I clinically can move the subtalar joint, I still offer them arthrosis because it's the same principle. Once you offload the arthritic part, the patient will have less pain. 
في سؤال تاني بيقول حضرتك كان يو اكسبلين هاو ذا ارثوريزيس سكرو وورك هاو ارثوريزيس وورك اه سكرو هو بيسال على المصم... يعني السكرو بيعمل يعني العمليه بس. نفسها اه So in principle, uh, you feed the guide wire through the sinus side, the subtalar joint, and as you're dilating with the uh, uh, with the sizes, so you start with size seven, it's up to fourteen. You keep looking at the AP view. You make sure you don't go beyond the tail of the the mid the midline of the talus, and on the lateral view, you look at the meridian angle. If it's corrected, what I do on the table, I move the heel into maximum varus. Yes, it is moving, so it's not overstuffed. And then move it back into valgus. It doesn't go that far. It means there will be no lateral impingement and there will be no tension on the medial side. And that's how I know my size. And that's how it works. And I think it's also going to play a role in the proprioception, Dr. Tariq. Right. The learning curve of the years after that. Exactly. But it needs, a, it needs a lot of intensive physio. I always tell my patients, part one of your rehab is the surgery. Part two to 10 is the hard work you're going to do with the physio. You've been walking like this for God knows how many years. And it won't be overnight that oh, it's not magic. It just takes time. في سؤال تاني هنكتفي بسؤالين بس يا جماعه عشان وقت البرزنتيشنز. هو بيسال امتى بنضطر نشيل السكرو؟ We used to remove the screw, but with the current available uh, uh, screw, screw materials and manufacturers, you don't have to remove it. اه في كمان بيستخدموا انترفيرنس والحاجات اللي هي بتبقى ابسوربابل دي. آه في ناس بتسال على البريكوشنز افتر سيرجري اند ديورنج ريهابيليتيشن ودي اعتقد ان هي بتبقى سيرجري سبيسيفيك لكل اه لكل حاجه اه حاجه روتين لكل الهايند فود ديفورمتيز يعني اه بالظبط آه بنشكرك يا دكتور طارق على البريكوشن الجميله دي ويعني سعداء ان احنا شايفين حضرتك في صحه وسلامه دي اهم حاجه شكرا جزيلا شكرا شكرا جزيلا دلوقتي المفروض انا اللي عليا الدور بعد اذن دكتور رضا هنتكلم عن شويه حاجات في البيزك برنسبلز كده على البيرونيال تندون ديس اوردرز بينا كده عاطف ولا ايه؟ تمام يا سعيد تمام اتفضل يا باشا اتفضل يلا اتفضل طبعا احنا هنحاول نخلي كل كلامنا عباره عن معظمه ستيل بيزكس يعني عشان برضو في جزء من الناس اللي من الزملاء اللي بيستمعوا لينا يبقوا عارفين البيزكس من الاول مش هنخش في حاجات عميقه قوي في الموضوع ده بالنسبه للبيرونيال تندون ديس اوردرز هي دايما بتبقى اندر ابريشيتد من الكلينيكال اكزامينيشن ومن الباثولوجيز اوف ذا انكل وان اوف ذا موست كومن سورس اوف لاترال هايند فوت بين الباثولوجي بتاعها بيزيكلي يعني كان بي ديفايدد انتو ثري كاتيجوريز تندونوباثي تندون سبلكسيشن اند ديسلوكيشن اند تندون سبليتس اند تير Uh, always there is associated pathology with peroneal tendon disorders. We have to think about this uh, uh, problem and should find uh, in every case of ankle pain uh, we face in our practice. Uh, the most of all is ankle instability and uh, virus valgus deformity. زي برضو ما تفضل زميلنا الدكتور طارق وكان قال في في المحاضرة بتاعته. ساعات بيبقى فيه هايبيتروفايد بيرونيال تيوبيركل وبتبقى برضو موجوده من ضمن الانفلاماتوري بروسيس في الروماتويد او السيرو نيجاتيف تينو سيرو ارثروباسيس برضو من ضمن المشاكل اللي بتبقى موجوده معاه. So the history and examination should be crucial to understand the problem of the peroneal tendons. As we know the basic anatomy of peroneal tendon they are peroneas brevis and longus. Uh, they are the main inverter of the hind foot, dynamically maintain the alignment of the hind foot. Uh, both of them are uh, innervated by the superficial peroneal nerve. Both of them uh, act as an uh, inverter of the hind foot. Uh, the peroneus brevis, responsible for 63% of the total inversion power. 
دي بيرونيا سبونجز بيسايد ات از ان انفرتور باور ات كان بلانتر فليكس از ا فيرست ري دي بيرونياس بريفز بتبقى مور كلوز تو ذا بون هي اللي ورا اللاترال مالوس على طول والبيرونياس بونجاس هي اللي ورا. بوث اوف ذيم ليهم ساينوفيال شيس اكستند ابروكسيمتلي 4 سنتيمتر بروكسيمال تو ذا تيب اوف ذا لاترال مالوس تو 1 سنتيمتر ديستال تو طبعا دي البيرونياس بريفز دي البيرونياس لونجس. البيرونياس لونجس اقوى واكبر ولكن هو الاواي فروم دي بون. Uh, both of the uh, Peroneus brevis and Peroneus longus uh, included in a retromalular groove with a fibrofartilaginous uh, 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 groove bounded by the superior peroneal retinaculum and the posterior telofibular ligament, calcaneofibular ligament, posterior inferior tibiofibular ligament, and they are maintaining the position of the peroneae uh, behind the lateral malus. This is the uh, picture of the retromalular groove. This is a fibrocartilaginous ridge preventing the anterior migration of the peroneal where uh, L superior peroneal retinaculum where L, L two tendons included within the group. As regards the epidemiology, uh, the prevalence, that, this is a general epidemiology about uh, peroneal tendon disorders. Uh, about the tears, peroneal previous tears is more common. Uh, acute peroneal dislocations misdiagnosed in about 40% of cases uh, often mistaken for lateral ankle ligament sprains. Uh, uh, and as we said, uh, from basics, always assess the alignment of the hind foot and the alignment of the foot and the ankle uh, in general, uh, because it may be the primary cause of peroneal tendon disorder. And in certain study, about 82% uh, uh, of cases operated for peroneal tendon tears with a supple uh, hind foot deformity uh, like the cable bars. I have the screen of the screen. I want to see what you're doing. What are you doing? Okay. Okay. Peroneal entrapment. Uh, between the fibular tip and lateral calcaneal roots also observed in the cases of heel valgus we will see of the malunited oscalsis which is peroneal tendon impingement between the uh, uh, oscalsis and the lateral malus. We will see also with the heel valgus the posterior tibial tendon dysfunction or in the rigid flat form. As regards the pathological conditions we will start by the peroneal tendinosis and tendinosynovitis. Uh, it's always an inflammation of uh, the uh, tendon uh, with its tendon sheath, causing posterolateral ankle pain that worsens with activity and improve with rest. Uh, there is a tenderness over the uh, peroneal tendon uh, uh, at the anatomical sites behind the lateral malleolus, and it could be associated with the bulb bubble mass that move with the tendon if the tenosynovitis is huge. This is the MRI of the uh, uh, peroneal tendon just behind the lateral malleolus. This is the lateral malleolus, this is the tibia, and this is the retromalleolar groove, uh, including the sheath of the peroneal. This is the brevis, just close to the lateral malleolus. This is the longus, and the both are uh, 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 swimming in uh, 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 synovitis uh, inside their sheath. The treatment of tenosynovitis, like any other uh, 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 simple uh, pathology, will start by conservative treatment, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory rest activity modification. Uh, and in the factory cases, we could use uh, immobilization in short leg cost. And uh, if the, uh, uh, the condition uh, progressive or uh, not, uh, use, not useful with the uh, conservative treatment, we can use a local steroid injection. Um, but we are afraid about the rupture of the tendon in the foot and ankle in general. And uh, at last, we could uh, proceed to surgical treatment uh, with open synovectomy, either an open traditional or it can uh, be done uh, by the mean of the endoscopy, uh, one of the uh, uh, recent uh, methods for minimally invasive uh, treatment of peroneal tendon uh, disorder. Uh, we can do synovectomy, we can do treatment, release of adhesions, and we can also remove the peroneal tubercle causing the friction uh, to the peroneal. The second topic is 
the peroneal subluxation and dislocation. Uh, it is a partial or complete loss of contact of the peroneal tendons uh, to their uh, teeth, uh, either partial uh, causing uh, the subluxation or complete causing the dislocation. Uh, the most common mechanism of this condition is forceful dorsiflexion of the ankle with the hind foot in inversion and uh, that will cause contraction of the peroneal, causing disruption of the superior peroneal retina. Uh, also, there are risk factors like the retromarular groove become convex, or in case of varus heel, this expose the peroneal uh, uh, more and more lateral and causing it to be liable for uh, the subluxation or the uh, Actually, they are classifying the uh, uh, subluxation and dislocations into uh, four grades according to the injuries occurring to the anatomical structures preserve the peroneal into their groove. In grade one, this is not just strapping of the superior peroneal retinaculum from the lateral malleolus. Grade two, with disruption of the fibrocartilaginous ridge. Grade three, which is mostly acute, with a bony flip bulged from the lateral malleolus. And grade four, all these structures uh, uh, are uh, disrupted from the uh, calcaneal insertion also. The presentation, the patient will come feeling a bop with the dystonic dorsiflexion ankle injury, um, comes uh, with an instability in the lateral ankle, with a posterolateral ankle pain uh, that may be distal toward the fibular tip. It can be aggravated by active uh, eversion or, uh, and or plantar flexion or by passive dorsiflexion. There are propagative tests that could be uh, used to diagnose the uh, uh, subluxation and dislocation uh, with an active dorsiflexion and aversion against resistance. This will cause the peroneal to sublux anteriorly. Also, you can uh, use a comparison test with pain and passive dorsiflexion and aversion of the ankle. The treatment starts always uh, in an operative treatment with a short leg cast, especially in the acute cases, uh, with protected weight bearing for six weeks. Uh, but uh, 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 in chronic cases, we could use uh, the surgical treatment. The basic step in each uh, surgical treatment is the repair of the superior peroneal retinaculum and deepening of the retromalular groove. And uh, all these procedures, uh, the up next procedures, according to uh, if there is there or no uh, uh, revision surgery and uh, so on. But the basic step is always the repair of the superior peroneal retinaculum and deepening of the retinomalar groove. And this is the basic procedure I uh, choose to uh, present in my uh, presentation. This is a lateral malleolus from the uh, back surface. We just elevate a window and we remove part of the uh, cancellous bone. Then we uh, repair the retinaculum and back the peroneal after deepening of uh, the retromalular groove. This is a very basic procedure could be done uh, in simple cases. Uh, there is a variant of the subluxation which is called intrasheath subluxation where the uh, peroneal reverses their anatomical position inside an intact uh, 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 superior peroneal retinaculum. We know that the peroneus brevis is the one just posterior to the lateral malleolus. This is the peroneus longus. When they reverse their position, this is intrasheath subluxation. It has two types, either uh, type one, when the peroneus longus uh, moves uh, anterior to the peroneus brevis, or type two, where there is a tear in the peroneus brevis through which the peroneus longus uh, crosses anterior. The last uh, topic we could speak about, the peroneal uh, splits and tear. And uh, one of the commonly unrecognized source of uh, lateral ankle pain, 40% uh, initially misdiagnosed. Uh, 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 there is a benefit in early recognition. And uh, when you uh, face a chronic degeneration involvement of based on both tendons, or uh, there is a tear more than 50% of the cross-sectional area, this will uh, give you a less predictable surgical results. Um, the epidemiology of the tears, uh, as we said, Berinoia's previous tears, about 88% uh, of cases, and it's mostly longitudinal split along the axis of the tendon. Uh, the longest tears, uh, rarely in 13%, and when there is a tear of both tendons, it's about 38% uh, of patients, and um, Berinoia's tendon tear seen in 
23% to 77% of all cases of lateral ankle instability. So uh, in the ankle instability, we do, we does not uh, also, we does not uh, ignore the peroneal tendon in examination and in treatment and uh, when we are viewing the MRI. You have to see the all aspect of the ankle. Uh, there is an anatomical classification according to the area in which the tear, uh, Brands and Smith uh, divide the areas of the tear into three zones. The zone A, this is a tearing occurring under the superior retinaculum, uh, mostly associated with subluxation. Zone B, the inferior one, the inferior veronia retinaculum, and it is uh, commonly associated with enlarged peroneal tubercle. And the last is zone three, where the peroneus uh, longus curve uh, to the sole of the foot around the cubeoid notch. And this is the most common site of injury of the peroneus longus tendon. And this is the zone one, the superior peroneal retinaculum. This is the zone two, inferior peroneal retinaculum. And this is zone three, which is most commonly for the peroneus tendon, as it is. Uh, 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 it goes under the uh, cuboid to the sole, uh, to the sole. The etiology of the tear could be hypertrophy of the peroneal tubercle, maybe due to trauma with the ankle sprain, maybe overuse, maybe with inflammatory arthropathy, and uh, may also be due to the osperoneum injury. The history and physical examination, like any uh, peroneal tendon disorder associated with pain, posterolateral worse with activity and uh, relief with rest, the examination tenderness over the peroneal, maybe a bulb bubble thickening, pain with passive aversion, and pain with a resistant aversion, and you can see the dislocated tendon as we said before. Imaging um, routine plain X ray uh, to uh, uh, yeah, uh, uh, avoid any missed bony injuries. Ultrasound could be used uh, in the initial uh, stages. But uh, for the Veronii to uh, well assess the view, we use routine MRI. This is a plain X ray showing the enlarged Veronia tubercle one CT, causing also the uh, frictions to the Veronii. And this is the MRI, this is the sagittal view with a complete rupture of the Veronia longus. And this is the axial view showing the tear of the Veronia longus and synovitis in the sheath. Also, there is tear in the peroneus longus tendon, the enlarged peroneal tubercle. And this is the uh, 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 axial view for the sole, showing the cuboid in which the peroneus longus is uh, torn. So MRI is a very routine to diagnose tendon injuries around the ankle. Uh, Merson uh, classify peroneal tendon tear uh, uh, into three types. Uh, according to which tendon is involved. In type one, uh, both tendons are intact, but with partial tearing. Type two, one tendon is intact, but the other uh, is a majority torn. Uh, uh, type three, both tendons are uh, uh, torn, but according to the muscle belly has an excursion or not. If uh, there is no excursion, it is type three A. If there is a good excursion, uh, it is type three B. And according to this classification, uh, treatment uh, will be planned. This is a simple algorithm uh, about the uh, types of the tear uh, and its probable treatment. For the type one, uh, grossly intact tendon with partial tearing, uh, just we will repair the uh, tendons, uh, excise the longitudinal split, uh, tubularize the tendon to uh, uh, suture it to itself to make a gliding uh, smooth tube. Uh, and the type two, if one torn, uh, one tendon is torn and the one is usable, perform it in uh, as Dr. Tarek said, the peroneus longus to previous or the vice versa. For the type three, which is complicated, both tendons are torn. Uh, we will see uh, if the muscle, proximal muscle of the peroneus has no excursion, so there is uh, no use uh, for repair. We will do tendon transfer uh, immediately. Uh, and uh, if there is a, an excursion of the proximal muscle, uh, when uh, the tissue bed is scarred, consider uh, allograft. So we can take any tendon allograft or uh, synthesized graft. Uh, or uh, uh, if there is no tissue bed scarring, you can uh, one stitch allograft or you go through tendon transfer. It's complicated cases for the chronic uh, uh, tear, and uh, you have to tailor your uh, treatment according to the patient function and the MRI find. Uh, this is a photo for the uh, Baroneus uh, brevis split longitudinal tear with complete rupture of the Baroneus longus 
and this is the fibula, this is the superior peroneal retiraculum. Uh, uh, tubularization of the tendon by suturing it to itself to make a gliding smooth tube and the tenodesis of the uh, peroneus longus to the peroneus brevis with the last repair of the peroneal tendon. Uh, all these surgeries uh, has many complications like scarring, wound dehiscence, uh, uh, nerve injuries, and so on. So uh, uh, you have to tell your patient about the probable complications that could occur. Uh, and I, I think it's a major uh, issue in uh, whole foot and ankle surgery, uh, especially as regards the satisfaction rate of the patient. After any surgery of the foot and ankle, you have to discuss uh, the surgery with its complication, its results with the patient before you go through. Uh, at last, uh, we have to uh, make an idea about uh, the differential diagnosis of peroneal tendon pain. Uh, it could be misdiagnosed uh, with any bony injuries like the fibular fracture, the lateral talar process fracture, anterior calcaneal process fracture, osteochondral defect of the talus, which is anterolateral or posterolateral, also fracture of the base of the first and the tarsal. All of these are differential diagnosis of the lateral ankle pain together with peroneal tendon pain. Also, ligamentous injuries, which is, com which is common, the lateral ligament complex or syndesmotic injuries, uh, Dr. Islam will tell us about it. Uh, also, impingement and uh, a nerve injury, sure, a nerve or subtalar pathology. All this differential diagnosis should be uh, in our mind uh, while we are uh, facing a case of lateral ankle pain and go through the examination to pick up which is uh, the probable diagnosis and what is the probable treatment. This is my uh, brief presentation, and thank you to all uh, of you. Shukran Saeed, presentation, Jameel. Very well demonstrated. And I'll try to see if Dr. Islam is done or not. Inshallah, very good. Okay, let's start. Yes. Let's stop sharing the screen, Saeed, and Dr. Islam will start. Okay. Did you get Islam or not? Dr. Adil, the story is very good. I'm going to start with you. دكتور اسلام طبعا هيكلمنا عن الهاي انكل انجريز واحده من التوبكس الكويسه جدا وهنستاذن الجميع بس لو في اي اسئله ليا او لدكتور اسلام تبقى بعد البرزنتيشن عشان بس وقت الناس اتفضل يا دكتور اسلام. Do you see my screen? Are you seeing my screen? We see your face. Not my screen. Okay. Uh, yes, Liam. I have a problem. Uh, I will have to leave and come back. Uh, just uh, okay, restart as they mesh. Okay, uh, sorry, uh, sorry, uh, I may be able to do it. Yes, I'm it, now. it is yes. working. Yes, okay, it work, Islam. Go on finally. Uh, first, I would like to thank you all, actually, Dr. Ayadil, uh, Dr. Abdullah, for your great effort and uh, for this uh, great scientific um, meeting. Um, uh, it's always my pleasure to be in Alexander and to always feel like home, uh, especially in this pandemic. So thank you for keeping waiting and uh, thank you for staying late. Um, I'm talking about the high ankle injuries and another name for syndesmotic injuries. Um, Usually, um, it's a high, uh, you need a high index of suspicion and you need to search for it. So it's not as straightforward as we may uh, think. And a um, uh, learning point from this will be just uh, go through some anatomy, biomechanics, and how to diagnose and how to treat. So syndesmotic injury uh, or syndesmotic instability occurs in about 25% of uh, all patients with ankle fractures requiring surgery. This is according to a uh, recent um, uh, publication. It is higher and uh, it's different between types of, uh, like Weber C, you can find the incidence of syndesmotic injury uh, reaching up to 90%. Um, and um, from the anatomical point of view, we have five ligaments uh, uh, consisting this uh, uh, structure. Uh, uh, the picture in the below is showing the anterior view, showing the anterior inferior tibial fibrillar ligament, which starts about one centimeter from the ankle joint. 
uh, and can join client. And uh, uh, sorry. And at the top picture, we can see uh, the different interosseous membrane, posterior inferior tibial fibular ligament, and then transverse tibial fibular ligament, which actually deepens the posterior uh, ankle joints and prevents Taylor subluxation. And there is another ligament, which is the posterior intermareolar ligament, which is a variant and could be responsible for posterior ankle impingement. Uh, functionally, um, um, ATF, uh, anterior tibial fibular, uh, anterior inferior tibial fibular uh, shares about 35% of the stresses, uh, followed by the transverse tibial fibular, uh, which is 33. Um, stability is really achieved by uh, holding the fibula while uh, uh, moving, uh, while the ankle is moving um, during plantar and dorsal flexion. And the way it does it, The way it does it is the fibula is goes uh, uh, by doing several movements, which is a rotation, either internal or external, medial or lateral translation, and vertical migration. And the movement between the intermarial are usually uh, by about uh, one and a half uh, uh, millimeter. Um, so uh, basically, synesmosis actually share, um, uh, helps to share uh, the loads on the ankle joints during movement and transmitted to the fibula by 16%. So uh, the, it's, a, it's a construct, it's the syndesmosis along with the fibula, it's not just the syndesmosis. Um, and the basic uh, principles are, uh, it uh, makes the mortis more integral during ankle movement. Uh, by doing this, uh, uh, helping to transmit the forces between the tibia and fibula. Uh, we find the, uh, the most advert or uh, unpleasant thing is to do uh, uh, shortening. Uh, so shortening of the fibula usually in increases with about 40% uh, 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 of the increased contact pressure on the, on the ankle joint. If, if there's shortening by about one to two millimeters to the fibula itself, um, this will affect the uh, joint, ankle joint in the future and increase the load contact pressure and uh, yeah, lead to early degenerative arthritis. So uh, this, uh, the migration of the fibula uh, up and down and in rotation occurs by the help of the foot flexors, which uh, uh, helps to tension or detension the, the interosseous ligament itself. So uh, basically the mechanism of injury is basically external rotation of the ankle, whether it is a, in a pronated or a, or a supinated uh, position of the foot. So when we do- Alles zum Scheu, Eslin. So when the, when the ankle is externally rotated, the talus pushes the fibula away and tears this ligament and puts its fracture to the fibula. Either it's a Weber C in a pronated uh, foot position or it's a Weber B in a supinated one. So types of uh, syndesmotic injuries uh, include acute, which could be with or without fracture or chronic ones. And the acute syndesmotic, uh, uh, injuries. Uh, we evaluate the patients, mechanism of injuries, uh, um, assess their soft tissue integrity as well and neurovascular integrity, and we do initial investigation, which is basically it's uh, X-rays, uh, mortis view and the lateral view. And you can see on the X-rays on the top, uh, we can't appreciate if there is any syndesmotic injury. But on the lateral, there is a, a shape of posterior uh, malleolar fracture. This is why there is an emerging uh, 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 consensus about doing a CT to these kinds of injuries in, in any patient with ankle fracture. Because you could appreciate on the, uh, on the picture, on the axial view, uh, there is a, a large chunk of posterior malleus development fracture which is at the posterior lip of the syndesmosis, and there is subluxation to the fibula as well. So the syndesmotic actually uh, is are, uh, disrupted in this case. Um, so we have to be really meticulous and, um, and uh, evaluate the patient thoroughly. And CT is really advisable and emerging thing to do at this point uh, to help to identify the anatomy and geometry uh, of the syndesmosis because they are different from each patient and, um, and you need to restore this in order to uh, uh, avoid a, a proper functional outcome. 
So uh, I will always keep this in mind. This is a, a nice uh, uh, diagram about the angles um, around the, uh, the the motors. And uh, so basically, we have uh, two spaces here: tibial fibular clear space, which is about six to ten millimeter, and the tibial fibular overlap, which is ideally should be less than uh, or between six and one millimeter. But I always keep this in mind. So when you do your reduction and uh, uh, achieve uh, uh, the reduction to synosmosis and have a, a proper view, you should allow for the tibia, uh, sorry, the fibula to be sitting uh, below the level of the media malleolus and restore the talopleural angle. Also, we should look for the Shenton's line, which is the inner aspect of the fibula along with the lateral process of the talus. So we should restore these anatomical landmarks and we should put this schematic view while doing the reduction intraoperatively. So uh, there is a, um, a literature published in 2019 uh, about the, uh, the syndesmosis and syndesmosis equivalent injuries in the tibia plafond. Have we ever thought of uh, syndesmotic injuries in tibia plafond fractures? I, I thought it's quite interesting because they found that 15% of patients with a tibial plafond fracture have uh, a syndesmotic injury. And they recommended that if you have a Chapeau or Volkman fragment, which is more than 10 millimeter uh, for displacement, it's, it's advisable to do a syndesmotic fixation. And you can see in the uh, CT scan, there is a, a, a Volkman uh, a fragment there and there's some displacement of syndesmosis, and they try to fix it by putting one screw across. So uh, it's different, and uh, um, this is this algorithm is very crucial. So when you're doing your uh, fixation to whoever be fracture ankle, always, always you have to examine it and after examine the most after plating of the fibula. So examination, yes, I'm going to. I'll speak to this later, but uh, uh, if you find it stable, there's no treatment. Minimal instability you can either treat this by tight roping or screw fixation and non way bearing, or there's obvious uh, stability and always have it two screws or tight rope. Uh, but this is different with a Weber C fracture. If you have a distal fracture, so plate the fibula is advisable and used through uh, the plate, you can use a tight rope or a screw fixation as well. But if you have a proximal fracture, which is like a mesonate fracture, we have a medial injury as well. Uh, you don't need to fix the fracture, but you need to restore the fibula length and you can put uh, either compression plate or two screws across. So uh, there is a very interesting paper from China, actually published in 2017. Uh, talking about uh, a new interoperative uh, classification. So the theory is uh, they have three classifications, A and B and C. If you have an interruption just to one ligament, uh, they consider this as a partially uh, or stable injury, and they don't do any fixation to this. Uh, but you have two or more uh, ligamentous injuries, and uh, uh, the the, the they consider this as unstable and especially to the rotation. But if you have more than two ligaments, two or above ligament, uh, and proximal migration to the uh, to the fibula itself, this is also considered unstable. So what they do is interoperatively. So after they fix the uh, the fibular fracture with the plating, they do the hook test. And almost always, when you do an ankle fracture, you have to use an uh, image intense file. You can't do an ankle fracture uh, nowadays without an image intense file or the CRM machine. So they do the hook test and uh, they pull the fibula out uh, of the tibia. And uh, if they find it less than four millimeter, they usually don't do any fixation. If they find the distance of the synosmosis uh, area increased from four to seven, they put one screw across. And if it is more than seven millimeter, they put a couple of screws. So uh, they also mentioned about, uh, they also mentioned about uh, 
only fixing the fracture, which is the, either the Voltman fragment or the Telochapo fragment uh, uh, alone, which will be more sufficient uh, to stabilize um, the syndesmotic uh, injury. All right, so in their paper, it was quite interesting. So um, uh, they encountered about 116, uh, 116 cases. Uh, and they found 70% uh, of the cases have a syndesmotic injury, and 45 were unstable, which are grade, uh, according to their classification, uh, grade B and C, which is there is opening more than four millimeter uh, of the syndesmotic by doing the hook test. And uh, they find the results after the fixation uh, have a good and excellent result achieved in 93 cases. So let's get back to important points. Uh, so technically wise, uh, you aim to restore the length, uh, um, you aim to correct the rotation and uh, reduce the syndesmosis with no anterior or posterior or medial translation. So nowadays, um, it's, uh, I'm just gonna go through some technical tips now. When we use the, usually use the reduction clamp uh, to reduce the fibula. So, if you have a, a CT, pre-operative CT in hand, it will show you where is the fibular displacement exactly and uh, which way you wanna pull your clamp. Uh, I, and most commonly, the fibula uh, falls posterior. So you want to bring it forward anterior. And they don't put the ankle nowadays in, uh, as we used to do in the old days in a dorsiflexion. Uh, so only do the ankle in uh, fixation of the transmotic in, in whatever ankle position. But you have to be also be careful when uh, not to over tight the syndesmotic um, uh, 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 joint because this can cause pain. And uh, and there is an, an interesting case actually from the states in 20, uh, 2006 um, about the sensitivity and specificity of the CT scan uh, compared to the radiograph, which is uh, more higher and more advisable to do. And uh, they found that the most common uh, man reduction is the posterior translation and the internal rotation of the fibula itself. So another uh, paper from uh, the injury in 2018 from, from, uh, from Italy actually. Um, so they, uh, they have three groups of patients. Um, uh, one who didn't do a CT before the uh, ankle fixation surgery, and uh, group two, they used uh, a preoperative CT on the injured uh, ankle, and the group three, they used the CT on uh, bilateral, the injured and uninjured side. Uh, this is to appreciate the different geometry and different anatomical variants uh, patients have uh, and to restore this. And they draw several lines just to uh, uh, precisely locate where you want to set your fibula uh, in the incisura fibularis. So uh, they found that the greater uh, function outcome uh, is uh, achieved by doing a preoperative CT uh, in the third group, which is the CT of the injured and uninjured ankle. Um, and this has helped you to correctly do your reduction and uh, fix the fibula uh, in a better position. And this is co was correlated with a better clinical outcome. Uh, another interesting uh, uh, paper from, um, um, I think, uh, state as well. So it's a RCT randomized control study uh, comparing fixation uh, with a tight rope and the screw fixation. And this uh, found that the incidence of mal reduction in the screw fixation was about 39% uh, compared to the tightrope. And uh, they found the most faulty uh, uh, mal reduction is the translation of the fibula, uh, either anterior or posterior. And, uh, but the functional outcome between both uh, the screw fixation and the tightrope uh, was no difference in the long term results. So, again, screw fixation is still a valid option uh, according to this study, recent study. Uh, and, um, uh, but the tightrope as well have an uh, uh, over superiorly 
uh, biomechanical uh, advantage. So because the screw group has a reoperation rate, higher reoperation rate, and of course you, you just put your uh, patients in a high risk of anesthetic uh, compared to the tight rope, which doesn't really require any uh, reoperation. Um, so going to the chronic aspect of the syndesmotic injury, uh, it's basically a rupture of the anterior inferior tibial fibula uh, ligament. Uh, it causes pain during activity, feels of instability or weakness. And you suspect these injuries when you have a, a very long recovery period. Uh, so, a patients who uh, have been informed that they have a normal lateral anterior sprain. So, basically, if you have a patient coming to you after six months of a inverted uh, or ankle injuries and still complaining of pain, you should put this in your uh, differential diagnosis. And they sometimes describe it as an open book injury of the mortis. So there are several tests. Uh, so apart from your history taking uh, and um, putting differential diagnosis, there are several tests. So we have the squeeze test, which is squeezing both tibia and fibula at the mid calf to reproduce this pain. And, and there is an external rotation test and there is a fibula translation test. But the test which has the high specificity and sensitivity uh, compared to the others are the fibula translation test where you feel the fibula is gliding um, um, across the incisura, which is not normal thing, and also it produces pain. Uh, next modality, of course, uh, if uh, suspecting a soft tissue injury, will be a um, uh, MRI scan, and you can appreciate the torn anterior inferior ligament there and the high uh, white signal intensity. So uh, you could treat these patients first by. Uh, actually area of, uh, period of conservative measurements, put him in a boot uh, uh, for about six weeks uh, and allow these ligaments to heal up. But if you have uh, failed, or if you failed the, uh, or exhausted all the conservative measures, uh, the role will be next uh, going to the ankle arthroscopy. So the benefits of the ankle arthroscopy in such cases is to confirm the diagnosis and remove the scar tissue and synovitis and uh, to explore any associated conditions causing the pain and help with the reduction. So this is a, a very short video uh, to one of my cases. Uh, just gonna go slightly. So this is gonna stop here. This is the talus. This is the tibia plafond. The fibula is just there. And this is where the syndesmotic uh, ligaments are or the joint is. Normally it's a tight closed space. You shouldn't be able to put your probe in uh, and, and you should be able to put your shaver on. So uh, you test it and you should feel it normally, you should feel it as a tight, closed space. Uh, but if it, you can see widening or you're able to put your shaver, 40 millimeter shaver inside it, uh, this is an indication of a syndesmotic disruption. So, uh, uh, so you deal with this uh, by shaving the, the brighted area, uh, the torn ligament, uh, fibrovascular tissues causing pain, and help with uh, assisting your reduction as well. So methods of surgical treatment include uh, fixations, reconstructions, and fusion. This is the hierarchy of uh, uh, dealing with the chronic uh, injuries. So fixation, as we mentioned, uh, we have the screw fixation. It could be done separately or through a compression plate or could be done by tight rope, which is consisting of uh, number five uh, fiber wire and holding it with end bottom from both uh, tibia and fibula. Uh, usually the tight rope is stronger than the screw and demonstrate uh, 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 late fatigue failure and uh, eliminate the complication of removing or broken the screw again and the simple minimal invasive technique. Uh, so if this fails, you go in with, uh, uh, with the next option, with the reconstruction. Uh, so uh, Boumer et al. Uh, uh, provided this technique, which basically uh, drilling and putting a, uh, a box, a osteotomy box, and uh, with the 80 anterior inferior tibia fibula and shifting it more medial position and fixing it with a screw just to tension the side of the anterior inferior tibia fibula, and you will supplement this with a syndesmotic screw as well. 
Uh, another thing of uh, if all of this failed is the fusion of, of the uh, uh, in cesura, including the fibula and tibia. So uh, you do an anterolateral approach. Uh, be careful with the common perineal nerves. You dissect and remove all the scar tissue. You refresh the area and supplement it with the bone graft. Uh, as you can see, this is an old case, uh, old case, as you can see, the medial injury, widening of the syndesmosis, and has been going on for more than uh, two years now. And uh, it failed all the conservative measures, and this is why they uh, uh, shift to doing the fusion, which is uh, more inferior in results to uh, deal with it as a primary pain. So uh, there is another issue which is uh, to be put in mind. I, I haven't seen this. Uh, but it's a good algorithm to see. So sometimes you may face with the recurrence uh, of a widening of the osmosis or instability after the screw removal. So if it is less than six months, it's still a valid option to do an open debridement and fixation with the two screws. If it is more than six months, you have to evaluate the integrity and the congruency of the axial joint itself. It's, if it's a minimal uh, incongruency, you can still with, uh, deal, deal with it as an open debridement. If you have significant arthritis and incongruity, you deal with it with a syndesmotic fusion and bony block. So to take home message, uh, I think it's uh, uh, an area that needs more exploration and you need to be aware of it and search for it. So it's not as straightforward as uh, we're thinking. And uh, there is an uh, evidence-based uh, importance of the pre-op CT uh, to evaluate the anatomy and uh, your reduction, help with your reduction uh, interoperatively. Uh, also, the algorithm for Weber B and Weber C, which I uh, provided in the presentation, uh, is, is very helpful to always test the most after you uh, plating the fibula, and you always have a, an X-ray uh, to evaluate this. And uh, lastly, screw fixation is still a valid option. Questions? شكرا دكتورنا العزيز اسلام على البرزنتيشن الجميله دي شكرا يا اسلام توك جميل والله شكرا جدا 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 انا مشكلين لحضرتك جدا يعني على الفرصه دي بصراحه يعني لا والله شكرا جدا فيري نايس فيري نايس كل حاجه حبيبي حبيبي يا اسلام والله بقول لك بقول لك يا سعيد انت ممكن تعمل البيبر اللي هو دكتور اسلام عرضها اللي هي بتاعت تشاينا دي لان السندسموتيك انجري من ضمن الحاجات اللي اللي ما حدش بياخد باله منها طبعا واحنا عندنا سي تي فممكن تديها رساله حلوه قوي يعني ماشي. وتحاول تعمل موديفيكيشن للحاجات اللي هم بيعملوها دي انا انا بديك فكره بس يعني ماشي يا بيه ان شاء الله شكرا يا اسلام والله شكرا جزيلا عفوا دكتور عادل عفوا في سؤال كده اللي هو يعني هو خارج شويه او يعني يعتبر جنرال بالنسبه للموضوع اللي بنتكلم فيه من دكتور احمد زهدي بيقول الديوريشن اوف كونسرفاتيف تريتمنت ان انكل سبرين بيفور اتمبتنج اوبريشن فده متاح الدكتور اسلام يجاوبه او الدكتور طارق يعني لو حد عايز يتكلم اتس ا فيري جنرال ثينج سو ات ديبندس ابون يور اسسمنت هيستوري تيكينج اكزامينج ذا بيشنت نو ويز ذا بين از اند وات تريتمنت بيشنت ريسيف سو بس But you have to be careful that patients having continuous pain after three to six months of an ankle injury, you should suspect other things. Other things is a very uh, wide topic, actually. It could be syndesmotic, could be uh, osteochondral lesions, could be uh, in some impingement, could be failed uh, healing of the ligaments, a lot of things. Apart from, no, ممكن يبقى fracture أصلا. يعني يبقى في body injuries من الأول. Yeah. I, I, I totally agree with what Islam is saying. It's uh, my threshold is three to six months. And uh, it is mainly, as we all know now, early mobilization is the cornerstone of management because the earlier you mobilize the ankle, the, uh, the better outcome. Uh, also, it's the physiotherapy. I use, I'm, I'm not sure how it works in Egypt, but the physiotherapy are my like uh, support. I send the patient to the physio, they know my protocol. And if the patient is struggling to do the physio, That's when they send the patient back to me to get further scans, further assessment. There is another question. Dr. Ahmed Zoudi, a very active shakl on the presentation on Narda. We all the anterior and inferior tibiofibular ligament injury without bony element. 
يعني هو الدكتور اسلام اكيد قالها في الوسط الكلام بس يعني it's 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 evidence based so if the patient only have an anterior inferior and it's a stable uh, on testing it it's a stable injury there there is no widening of the syndesmosis or there is no translation uh, i could still treat this conservatively like a, with, sorry without any fixation just with a boot but if there is evidence that there is gapping of the syndesmosis itself a fixation is advisable and usually the post op protocol to these patients you keep them non with bearing for six weeks and then they protect it with bearing for a boot for another six weeks uh, but it depends upon you having a tight rope or screws so the question of removing the screw or not still still debatable still a surgeon preference permanent controversy uh, exactly <laughs> uh, but it's 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 mainly how you uh, consent your patient and how you tell him firstly uh, Otherwise, uh, you want to remove it or not, uh, and what's your preference? But uh, it's it's no evidence base behind it. Okay. Doctor Khaled Lutz, he told me that he can. He asked me, "Hal, you are working in the same hospital that he was working in? It's a hundred percent. It's a Queens uh, NHS." Uh, no, I'm working in the same. I'm working in the same hospital in Derby Hospital, so it's the University Hospital of Derby and Burton. Uh, Queens Hospital, they have. Uh, Burton? It's a good thing. 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 It's a External rotation test is it more sensitive and specific than hook test? How does it behave when it's rotated? No evidence base, but yeah, um, it's done. It, hope, yeah, can start it. Can speak about it. Yeah, um, in my practice, it's the external rotation test. Uh, I stopped doing the hook. Uh, I do stress external rotation, and I do live fluoroscopy actually to mm. see if the ankle open up. Okay. So you, you, you drift the foot in external rotation. And I drift the foot in external rotation and I push the knee into internal rotation at the and same at time. The, and and, and if, I'm, if, if I'm worried, it means I haven't done a good job. So I need to go back and tackle it. Okay, if in AP view or Mortis view? AP view. AP view and then move it to Mortis and then do live fluoroscopy to check if the ankle on live fluoroscopy on the video is not, yeah, uh, yeah. Is not subluxing. Thank you. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you all my dear colleagues على البرزنتيشن الجميله دي واحنا يعني دايما بناخد حتت بلايند كده سبوتس في الاورثوبيدكس عشان نعمل جاذبيه للناس بقى تيجي في الفوت اند انكل سيرجري الدكتور عبد الله مسيطر على كل الناس الاندر جرادوت في المناظير والمفاصل عايزين اي شويه ناس يا دكتور عبد الله بالظبط يعني ما اي حد دكتور عبد الله يا باشا الناس عايز تمسك شواكيش وحاجات جامده و... وعضلات وكده احنا نجيب لهم يا بيه نجيب لهم بس يا مقاسات صغيره شويه <تصفيق> الهيب ممكن تعزق فيه زي ما انت عايز تخلي الفليجه بنت وانكر وحاجات صعبه قوي هذا الانكل الانكل لو انت معدي جنب العيان يقول لك لا انا تعبان لسه ايوه <تصفيق> نسيب الدكتور عادل رفعت رئيسنا الغالي يا ريت يبقى في فرصه ثانيه نقدم مور توبكس دكتور عادل اه بس ان شاء الله انت تدرب على الشير سكرين دي يلا خليك المره الجايه لا هو عشان لسه مغير منزل بس سيستم جديد فوزر يا عادي لا بس انت رائع يا اسلام صراحه يعني وطبعا طارق الجمل دفعتي وحبيبي انتاز الفرصه ان الدكتور عادل يعمل كونكلوجن للسيشن يعني انه شكرا على على اجابه الدعوه ويعني انسان طول عمره متميز ان شاء الله دي ج... ج... بص بصوا يا جماعه عشان تنقلوا برضو زمايلنا معاكم دي جاست ذا ستارت وانا املي ان ان شاء الله في اجتماع جامعه جهاز العظام المصريه اللي جاي سواء في سيشنز اونلاين او اون سايت ان انتم يبقى لكم الابر هاند للناس المصريين وانا معاكم ان انت قول لي انا جاي وابعت لي بس البرزنتيشن اللي انت عايز تقولها والاكوموديشن هتبقى فري لان انتم ستارز فعلا يعني انتم ستارز وانتم مشرفيننا بس انا ما اعرفش ليه انتم بتكبرين علينا باين ولا ايه مش بتحبوا تقولوا توكس فلا في الجمعيه في مؤتمر الجمعيه اللي هو آه، احنا كل آه. سنه آه. 
كل سنه بنعمل مؤتمر الجمعيه وبيجي ناس شويه يعني انتوا احسن منهم كتير جدا من من انجلترا يعني وكده فنفسي تبقى انتوا تبقوا يعني مور بريزنتبل في كل مصر طبعا طبعا اسكندريه احنا على الليفل بتاعنا احنا شويه برضو ايه مش مش يعني نفسي تبقى انتوا مور بابليك مور بابليك عن الجروب بتاعنا في اسكندريه فان شاء الله انتوا بس انتوا احنا كلنا يعني الجروب اللي موجود في انجلترا كله مش هقول كل اسماء يعني كل الناس اللي يحب يشارك ان شاء الله السنه الجايه في مؤتمر جمعيات جراحه العظام المصريه وانا برشح التوكس اللي انتوا بتقولوها دي في منتهى الجمال انها تتقال هناك ان شاء الله من غير اي افورت زياده يعني هو هو نفس التوكس دي ان شاء الله نقولها وتبقى من من خلالنا يعني انا هدعوكم للمؤتمر وانتوا هتبقوا اضافه جامده جدا وتدوا صوره احلى كمان لاسكندريه ان شاء الله ان شاء الله حاجة شرفنا يا دكتور عادل. حاجة شرفنا جدا دكتور عادل يعني. شكرا لحضرتك يعني. وشكرا لحضرتك. تو ورك ويز دكتور طارق مستر جمل يعني هيز ستار هير يعني. هيز ستار هير يعني راجل اتعلم منه كلنا بصراحة يعني. تروق عسل تروق عسل يا ابني يا ربنا يخليك يا تروق ربنا يخليك ويا رب ربنا يحفظكم كده يا رب وتمتعونا دايما بالحاجات الجميلة دي. ويبقى فورورد واكثر كوبريشن بيننا وبين بعض باذن الله ان شاء الله. ومعلش احنا اخرناكم اخرناكم جامد لا 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 شكرا اخرناكم جامد ربنا يخليكم ربنا يخليكم شكرا على خير تصبحوا على خير جميعا شكرا يا دكتور سعيد شكرا يا عبد الله ربنا يخليكم شكرا جزيلا تصبحوا على خير الله يخليك الله يخليك